Inner power, notice toward the breech of the gun. The back end, there's a pretty good size dent right there. That dent was most probably caused by French, possibly American artillery fire. In order for a solid shot to hit the gun in that location, most probably would have gone through the wheel first at the time. Once that happened, this cannon would have been disabled at least until significant repairs were made to it. So the dent remains before us today as a tangible example of the strength and superiority that the Allies were able to achieve here through their artillery firepower. And because artillery played a determining role in the outcome of this siege of Yorktown, as a consequence, artillery also played a determining role in the very outcome of the American Revolutionary War. It's been interesting for me to notice over the years that when folks end up here in Yorktown and talk about the most important periods or the most significant dates of the Revolutionary War, you know, inevitably the year 1776 comes up. We all know why that is, right? It was in 1776 that we told the world that we were independent through the Declaration of Independence. But were we actually independent in 1776? No, we were not. In 1776, that wonderful document was a promise. I submit to you that that promise became a reality when it was made a reality on the field of battle. And that is why this ground, and that is why this story are so important. So if you'll join me now outside, we'll take a look at the siege of York Town in considerably more detail. The right town of York is only about one quarter mile west of where we are right now. So the town itself is in that direction. And Yorktown is located on the south bank of what we call the York River, which you see right beside us here. Now, what we call the York River is actually a tidal estuary of the Chesapeake Bay. And the York meets the bay only about seven miles in the opposite direction of town. Beyond the point where the Uh, the mouth of the bay uh, opens into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, that is between the Virginia Capes. Now, looking across the water to the north, to the far tree line, the development that you see in front, we refer to that area today as being Gloucester Point. During much of the colonial and revolutionary period, you'll see it being referred to as Tyndall's Point, and occasionally the Boston. You read about the Yorktown campaign, you run across uh, Tyndall's Point, that is the area that is being referred to. And if you'll notice the bridge in the distance there, that bridge crosses the York from Gloucester Point, Old Tyndall's Point, to just the opposite or the west side of town. Now it's important, so if it's important to remember that during the colonial and revolutionary period, surrounding Yorktown was primarily agricultural. This was largely farmland, and as a result, it was much more open here then than it actually is today. There were far fewer trees here then than there are now. If that was the case today, if it was that open right now between where we're standing and where that bridge meets ground in the distance, you'd be able to see a good portion of the town between here and that point. Now, before he moved his army to Yorktown, General Cornwallis had been prosecuting aggressive and offensive military operations against Patriot forces in the interior of the Virginia colony. Those efforts positioned in New York that General Clinton ordered Cornwallis here in Virginia to cease offensive operations, 
to fortify a position that would be suitable as a naval port and the Leicester developed into naval ports. That then, and, and that's testified to by the number of naval installations that are close to us right now. That then begs the question of why was Yorktown the chosen site as opposed to some of those others? And I don't talk about who it was, Clinton or Cornwallis, that made the decision for Yorktown, especially given, given the fact that after the war ended, those two commanding generals couldn't decide who chosen Yorktown either. They both gave their credit for Yorktown's choice to the opposite party at that point. But we do know basically why Yorktown was chosen, and Yorktown was chosen primarily because of the characteristics of that great waterway. What we call the York River has one of the world's deepest natural channels. The channel of that waterway is generally, is waterways of that nature do it, it fluctuate, vary, but generally between 85 to 92 feet, making Yorktown's port a deep water port and allowing access to deep draft ocean going warships and transports, as it still does to this day. Think about what that meant for Generals Clinton and Cornwallis should that actual <clears throat> anticipated assault actually occur against Clinton's position in New York. If that happened, General Clinton would need support from Cornwallis in the form of mass numbers of reinforcements. Well, think about, think about the movement of troops at that time. In order to accommodate large warships, uh, deep draft vessels, they can carry the largest number of troops, you needed to have a deep channel and a deep water port. The characteristics of this waterway provided for those needs then as they still do now. So the York River and the characteristics of, of Yorktown port provided for the movement of large numbers of reinforcements if they had anticipated assault actually came to fruition against Clinton's position in New York. Secondly, notice the ground that we are on in relation to the level of the water. We're on what? High ground and elevation. Giving, it was believed, whoever commanded this ground, command as well of what took place on the water level at least close by. This was considered good ground to defend Georgetown's port at least against naval assault. And it's important to be aware or remember that in early August, when Cornwallis first moved here, he faced very little, very minimal enemy threat on the landward side. The threat that the British initially perceived against Cornwallis when he moved here, and therefore the threat that Cornwallis was ordered to prepare for, was primarily a threat by water. By the time Cornwallis moved to Yorktown, moved his army to Yorktown, the British, British authorities were well aware that there was a French fleet headed toward the North Atlantic coast from the West Indies. But they were not, however, aware that that French fleet, all told, when, when the French warships ended up in this area, in the Yorktown area, they would comprise about three, number, three times the number of warships compared to what the British had initially. And I emphasize that to bring to your mind the realization that for Cornwallis initially faced when he came here and what he was ordered to prepare for was very different than what he eventually ended up facing. He eventually ended up facing not only a numerically superior enemy naval force, but a numerically superior enemy ground force also. Now, once again, please notice where the bridge crosses the river in the distance. Our modern Coleman Bridge exists at that point primarily because that is an area where that waterway narrows considerably to form a natural bottleneck. The York is a bit more than a half a mile wide at that point. In many other locations, both east of us as well as west of us, the York is well more than a mile wide. That natural feature in Angle Cornwallis when he moved his ship to position troops on both sides of the water right at that natural bottleneck. He moved over a thousand troops across the way to Tyndall's Point. He retained over 7,000 troops here at Yorktown and he ordered fortifications.
fortifications constructed around both positions. What that then did for the British here at Yorktown is it funneled river traffic toward that narrow stretch of the waterway that was highly defended on both sides. So it gave the British more control <coughs> of access to their position by water. Again, initially, where the primary threat was expected to come from. Now, even though initially Cornwallis faced little enemy threat over land, he still needed to be aware of any approaches to his army's position over land, and he needed to defend against those approaches as well. He did this in a couple of ways. He ordered the fortifications constructed around his position, but he once again, and I'll describe the fortifications in just a moment, he also once again took advantage of natural features this time on the landward side. Yorktown is surrounded, not entirely, but almost entirely, by a maze of creeks and ravines. East of us is Longley Creek. If you do the driving tour, that will take you over that area and you'll see more clearly what I'm, what I'm talking about. Immediately on the west side of town is Yorktown Creek. Both of those creeks move from the river's edge, surround their respective sides of the town, and move off to the southwest in that direction. And both of those creeks set in the base of not only very deep, but very rugged and irregular ravines. Just to, to give you a bit of an example, at least in depth, if you'll notice the drop-off, the little gully right beside us here, Yorktown Creek, the one immediately on the west side of town, some areas twice that. Now consider the primary components of 18th century warfare. In the 18th century, the infantry assault was a major element of warfare. And for the most part, an 18th century infantry assault consisted of long lines of infantrymen marching shoulder to shoulder against their objective. In order for an assault of that nature to be effective, it was critical to maintain the organization of those long lines of battles. But that was very difficult to do when on the way to your objective, you had to cross rugged and irregular terrain features like those creeks and ravines. And that's to point out that the British position here at Yorktown was largely protected against the movement of enemy infantry. The only truly open ground leading to Cornwallis and his soldiers at Yorktown was approximately a half a mile of open ground between the heads of those two creeks. We will see that general area from a distance a little bit later on, southwest of us, that way. But for right now, just keep in mind that for the French and the Americans, that half a mile of open ground between the heads of those two creeks and ravines could be used as their avenue of approach of land to Cornwallis and his soldiers. To strengthen his defenses here, Cornwallis ordered two perimeters of earthen fortifications constructed around his army. The immediate perimeter of fortification still exists, at least in part, surrounding us right now, and is remembered as the British Interdefensive Line. And if you look behind you at the earthen mounds that are surrounding us, those are part of the fortifications, and they're at least partly original to both the American Revolutionary War as well as the American Civil War. The, map earth, the mounds of earth that exist there were put there by British soldiers during the Revolution as well as escaped slaves during the Civil War. They were added to and uh, strengthened by Confederate soldiers, slaves, as well as Union soldiers. For our purposes, they began just beside us on the water's edge, overlooking the water's edge, anchored on that natural piece of the waterway. Those fortifications extended in total distance, total length for over a mile. They were about 2,000 yards long. Now, if you remember the point at which you entered our modern driveway, it was right around that point that those fortifications swung sharply to the, to the northwest, and instead of encircling the town of York, 
the fortifications literally cut through the center of town. The result was that that portion of town that was outside of the fortification, about 25% of the town, Cornwallis ordered level destroyed not long after his army came to Yorktown. On the opposite side of the town, the fortifications again basically swung uh, to the northwest and ended basically anchored overlooking that waterway. So that might have begged a question in your mind. Why did the fortifications cut through the center of town instead of going around the town? And why did Cornwallis order the portion of town outside the fortifications destroyed? The fortifications went through the center of town because there is a ridge line in that area, natural high ground. And in order to take advantage of that high ground, the fortifications followed the ridge line and went through the center of town like the ridge line did. Why did Cornwallis have that portion of town outside of the ridge line and the fortifications destroyed? For the very practical military purpose of clearing a field of fire for his artillery. That was a primary purpose. The guns, the field guns and the siege guns of the artillery weapons during that period were direct fire, which meant if you were an artilleryman, you had to be able to see your objective in the distance that you wanted to hit with your, your cannon, your gunfire. If you couldn't see it, your cannon, your and, and cannons can be guns, mortars, and howitzers. In this case, for direct fire, we're, we're considering the guns of the artillery. In order for those to be effective, you had to be able to see what you wanted to hit, to hit them with your, your uh, cannon fire. Um, in addition, if an enemy was approaching the British position over land, they could use the structures uh, for cover, to cover uh, their movement, uh, to cover their, their actual position and to conceal their presence from the enemy. So to prevent that as well, Cornwallis had those uh, structures destroyed. Now, in your mind's eye, when you consider the main British defensive position here at Yorktown, as indicated by those fortifications, visualize a solid line of parapets, basically a solid line of earthen walls roughly in the shape of an irregular semicircle with a big dip in the middle because of where that ridge line is. Both ends of that semicircle of fortifications were attached to the water's edge. So the British position here at Yorktown consisted of that, the main British defensive position, consisted of that physical ground between the water's edge to my right, up to and including the earthen fortifications to my left. As you face the landward side, we are on the British left, basically the British left flank, the main British defensive position extending along the water's edge in that direction for not quite a mile. Now, along the length of the interdefensive line, the fortifications varied in terms of their dimensions. But in this general area, they were about 12 and a half feet tall. For the top, they were about 19 feet thick. So if you were one of Cornwallis' soldiers on this ground during the siege, what were those fortifications supposed to do for you? Protect you from primarily artillery fire. That's right. They were supposed to absorb that fire. And if an enemy was able to approach close enough to assault the British position, they were intended to act as an obstruction to that assault. Now, in addition to the immediate corner of fortifications, Cornwallis also had forward positions constructed as well. Forward fortifications about a quarter to a half a mile on the other side of the east. Those forward positions were not, however, a solid line of parapets. They instead were smaller individual earthen forts called redans and redoubts. And a redan is basically a two or three sided earthen fortification, somewhat shaped, somewhat shaped like an arrow or a triangle, with the apex pointed in the direction that the enemy would be expected to approach from. A redoubt is a four or multiple sided earthen fortification, somewhat generally shaped like a square or rectangle. They can vary considerably for a number of reasons, but, but generally. 
Those forward positions gave the British advance notification of enemy approach, and they also guarded specific terrain features. I'll give you one primary example, a part of which we will see from a distance a little bit later on. Redoubts number 9 and 10. Redoubts number 9 and 10 were on the extreme British left that way, and redoubts number 9 and 10 occupy what could be considered key or critical terrain on this battlefield. Redoubts number 9 and 10 for the British guarded their left flank, making it difficult for, the, for an enemy to get around the British left into the British rear. Redoubts number 9 and 10 also for the British helped to guard that half a mile of open ground to the southwest, making it much more difficult for the French and the Americans to approach over that territory. We will see later on that once the French and the Americans successfully took redoubts number 9 and 10, the distinct advantage those fortifications gave the British, or uh, gave the French and the Americans by comparison. So here, critical terrain, giving whichever side that held them a distinct advantage. Later on, we'll take a look at the, uh, the French and the Americans' perspective of that. So as of the end of, Oct uh, end of August, Going into the first few days of September 1781, this is roughly the situation that the British were in. This changed for Cornwallis and his soldiers pretty dramatically on September the 5th. We'll see why. We'll also then take a look at the arrival of French and American ground forces in the area and see how they began to use these same features against the British. And we will also begin our consideration of the role of artillery. So we'll move to our next location. Would you rather sit facing sunlight or would you rather stand in the shade? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll go to the tall pine tree. 1881. Probably the unthinkable happened for you that day. September the 5th, 1781 is the day one of the world's most significant naval actions took place. Under the command of Admiral Scott Ross. With the wind, can you all still hear? I can't get a big gauge. Now, history remembers the Battle of the Cape as being a draw in tactical terms. The conclusion of that naval battle, neither side had a distinct advantage. As a result of the Battle of the Capes, the British commander, Admiral Graves, made a critical decision. His decision was to withdraw his British warships to New York for repairs, feeling that they had been so heavily damaged in that naval battle. Well, think about the consequences here for Cornwallis once he did so. Once Graves, Admiral Graves, Bay and therefore access to the British position by water, the York River. Admiral de Grasse and the French fleet. And de Grasse took advantage of Graves' withdrawal by then using his French warships to blockade the bay. The other consequences for Cornwallis and his soldiers here, and meant that Cornwallis was deprived of his whole purpose in coming to Yorktown in the first place to establish a naval port and and left Cornwallis and his troops here in Yorktown without means of escape or means of provision, at least by what for many years up to that point had been considered the British strength by water. Effectively, what the Battle of the Capes did was for a very limited time and in a very localized area 
The Battle of the Capes meant that the French had wrested naval superiority from Again, limited time, localized area. Were we the Americans seeking our independence? That not At the same time, you all remember where Rivers Washington and Russia flowed were when Wallace first began moving his army to the right? Where were Washington and Russia flow? In the area of New York, threatened assault against General Glenn. Well, not long after the middle of August, only a very few days, Washington and Russian Bow began to very stealthily and very deceptively begin moving the bulk of their forces away from the area of New York and toward the south. So that on September the 14th, keep in mind that's only nine days after the Battle of the Capes, on September the 14th, Washington and Russian Bow themselves arrived in Williamsburg, West of us. Within 10 days to two weeks later, their combined army estimates range in terms of numbers. They vary considerably. The generally uh, accepted estimate is approximately 17,000 troops. American Continentals, Virginia militia, and French army soldiers, they gathered at Williamsburg as well. It was on September the 28th that that combined Allied land force to Yorktown on September the 28th. And so by the end of the day on September the 28th, for all intents and purposes, those French and American ground forces had that half a mile of open land to the southwest. They had that basically covered, at least a loose blockade. So now consider your position. If you're a British soldier on this ground, the end of the day on the September the 28th, that water was now more white. You're back, and it was controlled by your enemy. That's right. The only true means of movement in and out of your position that was now controlled by your enemy as well. So if you're British, you're left with those areas both west and east of town where those natural features are. Those creeks and ravines continue to serve the British as barriers against the movement of enemy infantry. But at this point, what did those same natural features also do to the British? That's right. So for all intents and purposes, again, by the end of the day, on September the 28th, the French and the American, in Yorktown, when I say siege, Yorktown is considered to be a loose siege for several reasons but a siege nonetheless. The French and the Americans basically had satisfied the foundational <clears throat> principle of the siege. They had the British surrounded. When you surround your enemy, what kind of things do you prevent them from receiving? Supplies, ammunition, manpower. Uh, thank you. I always wait for manpower reinforcements. You touched on it all. <laughs> <laughs> Supplies of any type, Foodstuffs, weaponry, ammunition, uh, reinforcements, importantly. Because remember the approximate troop strikes. Washington and Russian bow soldiers outnumbered Cornwallis's to the point that many felt it was fruitless for Cornwallis to try to take the initiative, seize the initiative, and extricate his army by force. So if the French and the Americans were able to maintain all of those conditions here, what would eventually happen to Cornwallis? They'd be starved into surrender. Is that generally a quick or a slow process? Generally slow. And for a number of reasons, Washington and Russian Bow were well aware that they did not have unlimited time to await the whole outcome, uh, the full outcome of starvation. While that process, though, was indeed taking its toll, the French and the Americans also then prosecuted the other techniques of classic siege warfare, which included using the power of their allied artillery to begin a bombardment of the British position. Ideally, the French and the Americans wanted to use the guns of their artillery to begin blasting away at those earthen fortifications surrounding the British to the point that large gaps 
physical breaches were created in those earthen walls. All the while that the Allied artillery was achieving that objective, French and American infantry and artillery kept moving closer and closer to the British position. So that if Cornwallis did not surrender outright, French and American infantry forces would be able to move within assaulting distance of the British position and take the British position and the weakened British army by storm. But that assumes something. Was it just the French and the Americans here that had the cannon? The, the British did too, right? So for the French and the Americans to achieve their objective with their artillery, for the French and the Americans to weaken the British fortifications with their guns, weaken the British force with not only guns, but with mortars and howitzers, the French and the Americans had to be able to overpower the British artillery in order to be able to move forward and assault and take the position if they had to. The French and the Americans had to achieve a superiority in artillery firepower. Now the tactics of that period, the tactics of that time, pretty much dictated that a surrounding force, the besieging army, should have a two-to-one advantage in numbers of guns over the surrounded force. That's exclusive of the mortars and howitzers. That's just the guns of the artillery. Two to one advantage. In the lobby, I mentioned the number of cannon that Cornwallis surrendered at the conclusion of the siege to Washington. Do any of you remember that number? 248. What was that? 244. 244. Very few folks actually remember that, that specific number. In order to achieve the desired superiority in artillery firepower, did the French and the Americans have more cannon than did the British here, or did they have fewer cannon than did the British here? Fewer. I tried to sucker you down the wrong road, but I, I figured you guys would be too swift for that. You're absolutely right. The French and the Americans only had half the number of cannon compared to the British. Between 100, roughly a half, uh, half the number. Between 120 to no more than 130 cannon. How then, that raises a question, right? How then were the French and the Americans able to achieve that desired superiority of the firepower? Nope, that's not it. Although I like when people bring that up because uh, that's a, Washington actually desired that very thing from the water, uh, but uh, de Grasse refused for the most part. For probably Washington, throughout the siege, Washington corresponded with de Grasse and tried to convince de Grasse to bring warships up to just opposite or just beyond Yorktown to participate in the bombardment. And de Grasse refused until the last day or so, and by the time he agreed, Cornwallis had asked in terms of surrender and it was a good point and it never ended up happening. I imagine it was legitimate for de Grasse to tell them that Yorktown a deep channel still very much the confines for the river. And de Grasse's fleet had, is an ocean-going fleet. And um, if you didn't, of course, for vessels in that area, if you didn't have wind, wind, the old wind, wind and wood navy, you had no wind, you had no mobility, so you were susceptible to a number of things uh, from the enemy. And, and the French had to be very uh, protective of their... They had to secure their forces here as much as, as possible. So a good idea, but no. When the, the destruction of the British guns reduce, change the number that they were fighting against? And sure, sure. Improve. But in order to destroy the British guns, that was that was made possible largely because of the superiority in artillery firepower. So what gave the French and the Americans the superiority in artillery firepower? That is a height. How about the lack of ammunition? You, ma'am, you just, you just, basically, that is one of the primary, the, the larger cannonball, the larger cannon ammunition, uh, solid shot and, and exploding bombs, meant that they came from larger caliber cannon. And the larger caliber cannon or, or is one of two primary principles. The other principle that I'll refer to a little bit later on is mass and concentration of fire. 
the one we like to talk about here uh, in view of where many of the different types of cannon are is the respective, uh, the, the types of guns that the respective sides had. Although the French and Americans had half the number of cannon, the greater proportion of French and American cannon were the larger, heavier cannon, both guns as well as mortars and howitzers. Larger caliber cannon here gave the French and Americans two basic advantages. Keep in mind the four-fifths of the British artillery. Roughly that's around 200 cannon or 12 pounders, just like the one we saw in the lobby. Much of the British artillery here was even smaller. In terms of guns, the British had nine, some nine pounder guns here. They had a large number of three and four pounder guns here. And they had a fairly respectable number of a piece that was considered to be a state of the art field gun during that period and the battalion gun of the British Army, the British Light Six Pounder. And if you look at the piece that our very diligent and committed volunteer, Al, is shining right now, he does a lot of work for us, a lot of work. That is a reproduction of the British Light Six Pounder. And if you look at the end of the line of artillery, on the burgundy fuel carriage. Uh, that is an original British light. Now, the British light six pounder was light enough and mobile enough to move onto the field of battle with battalions of infantry to give direct support to infantry in an open field engagement. As originally designed and in its earliest development, artillery had begun as a heavier, bulkier weapon too weighty, too cumbersome to move with an army in active field operations. So their use at that point had been reserved for static engagements uh, and or situations where, where the cannon did not have to be moved around as much. It was only later that artillery developed effectively as the lighter, more mobile weapons. The engagement that took place here was, however, indeed a siege. The iron gun on the garrison carriage, that is a reproduction 18-pounder siege gun. Not only did the French and the Americans here have more of the 18-pounders than with the British, if you will look at the big gun on the big blue carriage to my right, that is a reproduction 24-pounder siege gun. Not only did the French and the Americans have more of the 24-pounder siege guns here than the British. They had more by at least 11 to 1. On this side of the water, at the siege of Yorktown, the British had no siege guns that were that long before. The one siege, pounder siege gun that we know the British had here at Yorktown was across the water and their fortifications so to illustrate the advantage those large heavy siege guns gave the French and the Americans, take just a moment to compare the 24-pounder to the 6-pounder. That 24-pounder used roughly four times the explosive charge of black powder compared to the 6-pounder. Well, think about that for just a minute. Not only will that greater propelling charge of black powder throw that heavier cannonball, It'll throw that heavier cannonball, what? Farther. Farther means you have greater range compared to your enemy. Greater range means you can hit them before they can hit you back. So what it, you know, like, kind of like a boxer with a longer reach. But what is equally, if not more important, if you take that greater propellant charge of black powder, you combine it with throwing that heavier weight, that will then produce more what? that? That's right. More kinetic energy, which translates into more velocity, which translates into more force on impact, which means more damage and destruction. So even when the lighter caliber British field pieces were within their effective striking distance, at that same range, the larger, heavier Allied siege guns were going to do much more damage. 
eyewitness accounts tell you the story much better than I can myself. They paint a much more vivid word picture for you of what the people did at that time actually There was a British lieutenant who was only about 300 yards from where we now are during the Allied bombardment of October the 12th. This is what British Lieutenant Bartholomew James wrote in his journal. In 52 minutes after my arrival at the Horn Wall, the enemy silenced the three left guns by closing the embrasures. Shortly after which, they dismounted a 12-pounder and knocked off the muzzles of two 18s. And for the last one 18 pounder with a part of its muzzle also shot away. With this, I kept the fire until it rendered useless. Now that is very reflective of a much larger body of quotes that testify basically to that same experience on behalf of the British. Now keep in mind that the guns of the artillery of that period generally fired between zero elevation. So they usually threw the projector with a somewhat flat artist trajectory. Also keep in mind that the French and the Americans use those large heavy siege guns for two primary purposes. Well, break apart the fortifications and then the and what is today termed to be Both sides had other types of cannon that they used here for a different intended purpose, and those cannon fired a different type of projectile to accomplish that purpose. Both sides had mortars and powers. And if you look just over here, you can notice the first black piece, with the wooden bed without wheels, that is an original mortar. Just beside the The, the mortar was a much older weapon than was the howitzer. The howitzer was much more recent than the mortar was. So the howitzer was more versatile. It was intentionally designed to incorporate some of the features that it was very difficult to make the mortar do. The mortar was People like Henry Knox here at the Siege of Yorktown didn't manipulate the mortar to fire at a different elevation, but apparently it was difficult and cumbersome to do so. For the most part, the mortar did fire at the 45 degree elevation. Also, the mortar was specifically designed to be able to fire what during the revolutionary period was called an exploding bomb. Same same basic thing during the American Civil War was called the explosive shell. The howitzer, by comparison, and an explosive bit, that was basically a longer range anti personnel weaponry or anti personnel ammunition of that period. The howitzer had been designed to fire not only the exploding bomb, but also canister, short-range anti-personnel uh, ammunition, as well as the solid shot. Grape shot was used during that period, but grape shot was, uh, and I, uh, I can describe the Civil War grape shot a little bit better, two discs with iron cannonballs behind them and uh, circular rings, so very, very similar. It was used a lot in naval warfare uh, during during that period. Um, but in any, any case, the, the howitzer is also on a traveling carriage, making it more mobile. The howitzer was designed to be able to fire, to change its elevation uh, when it fired. Of course, if you're an artilleryman during the American Revolutionary War, all other things being equal, when you can change your elevation, your corresponding range also changes as well. 
but the point being with the mortars and howitzers, they could fire at a high enough elevation that they could throw those exploding bombs and they would be carried over and beyond the British airports and they did indeed explode. The exploding bomb basically being a hollow iron shell that is filled with explosive black powder. The iron shell having a hole in it in which was placed a wooden fuse plug with a paper fuse of a that paper fuse so however long or short the fuse was determined both the duration that the bomb flew in the air and the corresponding distance it covered before the fuse burned down into the main charge and then you know what happened exploded during the hot iron fragments into a large radius of whatever was nearby again the British and Americans had a greater proportion of larger caliber mortars and howitzers than did the British so they would fire those exploding bombs and they would continue to fire beyond the British earthworks and then amongst those British troops. And again, eyewitness count that gives you a better idea of the effect those weapons and that ammunition had here on the British. Now this is a bit of a graphic account. Please know that's not why I mention it for that purpose. I mention it because not only is it an eyewitness testimony that helps us to understand the effect of on the British, and perhaps it gives us an inkling of what they went through here. But it also helps us to understand why the French and the Americans were victorious after an eight-day bombardment. James Thacker, a soldier serving, or a, a soldier, but a surgeon, I should say, serving here with Washington's Continental Army, wrote in his memoirs about those weapons and their ammunition. He noted, I have more than once witnessed fragments of the mangled bodies and limbs of the British soldiers thrown into the air Now, I don't know about you folks, for those of you that uh, are my age and maybe a bit older, but as I get a little bit longer in the tooth every day, you know, eight days does not seem to be now as it did when I was that young gentleman's age. I mean, you remember when you're that age and it's eight days to your birthday? You're kind of sure your birthday is never going to get there, right? But it does depend on circumstances, doesn't it? Consider if you're a British soldier, literally on this ground where we now are, and one night you knew that one of those exploding bombs was headed your way. And you knew that because they say during the Revolutionary War, when those exploding bombs were fired at night, they say you could follow the path that the bomb was carried through the air by following the trail of fire that that burning fuse left. You saw that headed your way here. You didn't know if it would take you, if it would take the soldier next to you, or it could, according to accounts, some of them did here, take a whole handful of British soldiers. How long do you think that knee case would have seen? And when the bombardment began, if you were one of those British soldiers here, you had no way of knowing if it would last for eight days or if it would last for 108 days. I have been told by Vietnam War veterans who had been subject to sieges that the worst thing is the impact that that had on your morale and your willingness to continue in a very, very short time. At our next and final location, we will see how the French and the Americans combine the features of geography and the terrain described, the strength of this firepower, and the other techniques of classic siege warfare to force the British surrender. Before we move on, though, thoughts, comments so far? You bet. The only ones I've memorized. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at least I can, uh, and I base this off of a 1780 treatise of artillery, uh, one of them that was used by the armies of that period. And it gives a table of maximum ranges. It has not, as far as I found, and it's rather dry reading. I haven't done it from cover to cover. I've, you know, gone through and tried to find what I needed to find. I haven't found a, a table of uh, effective ranges, which would be more useful. For what it's worth, 
the maximum range for the 24 pound according to that 1780 treatise of uh, artillery and maximum range is when they are fired at 45 degrees 45 degrees will give will give maximum range is 49 somewhat over 4900 yards it was either 4910 or 4932 4900 yards uh, the six pounder uh, maximum range for the six pounder was somewhat over 29 the range would be much more and, and more useful figure I've never find found a primary source with effective range although I can give you secondary account uh, of uh, point blank range and that is a bit more useful here it will give you a better idea I think the secondary source is point blank range for the 24 pounder point blank range of course maximum force on impact but but shorter range um, maximum or uh, point blank range for the 24 pounder was 600 yards Point blank range for the uh, for the six pounder was it actually gives a, a varying degree for the six pounder between 350 to 600 yards. Okay, now you might be thinking, well, it would be almost the same. What would be the difference? When we get on the other side of the fortifications, and you can see the opposing lines from just about where we'll be to where you can see close to where the Allied first siege line begins, it's an average of about 850 yards. And as you move along the first Allied siege line from the point where it begins to the water on the southwest, or excuse me, southeast, it gets further away from the British position, so it's over a thousand yards away. So at the beginning point of the first Allied parallel, average of 850 yards, the 24 pounder is very, very nearly within its point blank range. Whereas the six pounder is most probably getting getting to the uh, getting close to the uh, it's yes sir. It's especially the extremity of its uh, effective range. Yes ma'am. So the American Revolutionary War as well as the American Civil War. I always try to give a good, uh, strong preservation message about them. Unfortunately, our park does allow folks to walk on the original fortifications. On causes erosion and breakdown. And because these are original, we would really love to have them around so that when those young folks come back here with your descendants in 50 and 60 years, these will still be in as best sh the shape as we can provide them with so they can take as much about this site as we can today. So if any of you are feeling your oats and wanting to go running down, up and down the roads, please don't do it on the original. For the for the sake of resuming our main storyline, those fortifications do indeed indicate to us the main British defensive position. We know that Cornwallis and the bulk of his forces were behind those fortifications. Do you recall my mentioning that the British also had forward positions as well, redans and redoubts? Most of those Cornwallis ordered abandoned the night after the Allied arrival in the area. He did, however, retain a few significant forward positions. And on the British left where we are, we retain redoubts number nine and 10. So if you will look toward the southeast, a couple hundred yards there in front of us, you see that single tree? Just on the opposite side of the tree, you see the earthen fortification? That is redoubt number nine. And if you look to the left of redoubt number nine, you'll see a little earthen wall Ignore that for right now. That was a later addition, so I'll describe that to you in the chronological uh, timeline. Now, redoubt number 10 is outside of our view, but to give you an idea of where it is, if you look further to the left and you notice where the vehicles are parked there, and then there's a clump of a couple trees, just to the left of those 
that clump of trees where the heavy tree cover begins, where doubt number 10 is basically just on the opposite side of where that heavy tree cover begins. Keep in mind as well, those creeks and ravines on either side of town, because they helped to determine that this was a siege. They helped to surround the British Army. So that half a mile of open ground that Washington and Rochambeau did indeed use as their avenue to approach the British, that half a mile of open ground is directly in front of me that way. Now Washington and Rochambeau needed to be able to continually move their forces over that open area and closer to the British position, while at the same time using their allied artillery to weaken the British, they needed to be able to protect their own troops from British return fire at the same time. They did this through the techniques and the tactics of classic siege warfare, more specifically having siege parallels constructed. And a siege parallel basically is a trench that is dug parallel to at least as the trench is being dug, the dirt from the trench is thrown up to the side and face of the enemy, so it will then form the earthen barrier, the firmer, the manning the trench. But it is critically important as well to incorporate artillery as a part of that parallel as well. The primary means that the Allies used to do this was by adding specific artillery positions along points of that parallel. And that enabled the French and the Americans to utilize a critical principle in employing their artillery, the principle of mass and concentration Instead of spreading their cannon out along the length of their line, one, two, maybe a couple pieces at a time, instead of doing that, the French and the Americans combined greater quantities of those larger caliber cannon together behind those earthen emplacements, in some cases forming artillery complexes, and that enabled the Allies then to thereby successfully suppressing British return fire. That is basically when the parallel was perfected, the bombardment then began, and then under the cover of the Allied artillery bombardment, French and American troops Basically, the, the combat engineering troops of that period moved outside the first parallel and began to construct approach trenches, also called sap or zigzag trenches. Trenches at alternating angles to the enemy position to prevent the British from firing down the length of a straight trench. That enabled the French and Americans to move several hundred yards closer to the British and off of those approach trenches, the Allies then constructed a second parallel, thereby shortening their line, shortening the distance they had to cover. They moved their infantry and artillery into that second parallel, and when you move your weaponry closer to their objective, that makes your weaponry all the much more what? Accurate damage and destructive. The siege manuals of that period dictated that no more than three parallels, manuals, no more than three parallels should be necessary under these circumstances before the surrounded force would either surrender outright or the advancing force would be able to move with an assaulting distance and take the enemy position by storm. So those are the Allied objectives. Now take a look, take a look beyond the, the clumps of trees that you all the way to the farthest tree line in the distance. At the base of that farthest tree line, can you see the sun glinting off the vehicle far way out there? And just to the right of that vehicle, you see the little earthen mound? Okay, that is the location of the first Allied parallel. One of Washington's soldiers noted that it was under the cover of what he termed was a rain-soaked darkness on the night of October the 6th that 1,500 French and American soldiers took the muskets, the weapons, and they laid those down behind them. And instead, when they advanced several yards forward, what tool, what tool were they handed that night that actually served as much better And then defensively, the shovels enabled you to move closer to your enemy. Defensively, provided you with protection. So that's kind of, you know, any, yeah. Okay. 
So, you were a French American soldier that night. You spent the night constructing part of that first parallel. By daylight, that next morning, on October the 7th, the trench was four feet deep, 70 feet long, and you had very nearly extended it to a half a mile in length toward the water on the south. Over the course of the days that followed that, by the afternoon of October the 9th, you taken that first parallel all the way to the water's edge on the southeast. Now keep in mind that the French held the left, the west of the Allied lines, and the Americans held the right, the east of the Allied lines. The Allied bombardment began that same afternoon, October the 9th, around 3 p.m. The French fired the first cannon shot on the left. Approximately two hours later, George Washington himself fired the first American important thing, however, to remember about those two opening shots is the overwhelming power and superiority of the artillery bombardment that they inaugurated. French and American artillery fire was so overwhelming that in less than 24 hours later, by midday on October the 10th, British return fire was held to an estimated average of only six shots per hour. And that estimate was given by a French officer who was here, and he, he actually received that, that, that British fire. And a British officer basically testified to the truth of that French estimate when he later wrote in his memoirs, on the 10th, scarcely a gun could be fired from our works. Fascines, stockade platforms with earth guns and gun carriages, being all pounded together into a band. The chief of Washington's Continental Artillery for the bulk of the war, Peter General Henry Knox, was here, and Knox estimated in that campaign, he estimated that the British Americans threw 15,437 rounds into the British position. He didn't have complete French numbers, but that works out to better than one shot every minute. Is it any wonder to you that by the afternoon, or by the evening of October the 11th, the evening of the next day, the French and the Americans had already moved approximately four to 500 yards closer to the British, and that night they were able to open their second parallel. Is everybody doing okay, by the way, out here in the standing the sun? Now, take a look toward the uh, southwest, more to the right. Can you see where a national flag is flying out there against the tree line? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the base of that flagpole, you see the little earthen mound out there? Okay. And right in front of the, the building, you see the earthen mound? That is the location of the second Allied parallel. Like the first parallel, it was basically dug to the same depth, the same width in one night's time. Critically different importance, however, though, critically important difference, however, initially with that second parallel, the Allies were stopped. They were prevented from extending that second parallel to the water on the southeast. My question for you is, what stopped them? That's exactly right. And look at the angle that holds over much of that second Allied parallel. From Redoubts number 9 and 10, the British could gain what is referred to as an effective enfilade fire or a flanking fire. Now, I'm sure all of you use that terminology in everyday life, right? Okay, Alec, to give you a, a, a better, a little bit better of an idea of what enfilade fire is and what it's not, can some of you find a form of straight line in front of me and from, uh, from my right to my left? We use these two. Okay, if you're a single line of infantry in front of me from my right to my left, okay, 
and imagine that like the French and the Americans, it's French, because that's going to limit your mobility. I am your enemy, and I'm an artillerist, and I'm holding my cannon in this position, and I'm fronting, fronting you. So I'm going to have a frontal fire, a fire that is perpendicular to your line. If I fire at you from here, from this angle, but I do not have accurate range, and my fire goes over and beyond your line, none, right? Even if the artillerist in this location is experienced, and they say during the revolution that an experienced artillerist can get the round projectile to fire on ricochet. Ricochet fire is where that round projectile will bounce. It'll skip along the ground, kind of like if you take a basketball and toss it at the ground. Well, that very likely, it could penetrate the line. How much impact is that really going to have in terms of numbers? Very few, limited. But again, will the good gentleman there on the end, will you step that way and face them for me? See that good gentleman there? He is my comrade in arms. He is also an artilleryman. He has his cannon pointed at you from that angle. If he fires at you from that angle, what kind of potential impact would his fire have against your position? My favorite analogy is Dom and the Dom. Thank you very much. That is in fire. That is what the British could achieve. So in order for the French and the Americans to secure that second parallel, they need to take it to the water where it'd be very difficult for the British to get on their plane to achieve that. And it would also ensure that the Allies would be able to move further within assaulting distance of the British position. They're going to need to take redoubts number 9 and 10 by storm. Washington ordered the assaults against redoubts number 9 and 10 to take place on the night of October the 14th. Interestingly enough, though, do you know General Rochambeau's second in command, Major General Baron de Biamadil? Do you know that he initially argued that the assaults against redoubts number 9 and 10 should only be the responsibility of the French? Because he did not believe, and he argued that Washington's continental soldiers did not have the experience necessary to undertake such a dangerous night time of need. Well, you remember Major General Marquis de Lafayette, don't you? He was a Frenchman too, right? But in whose army did Lafayette hold his officer's commission? Washington's Continental Army, the American Army. And Lafayette argued on behalf of his American soldiers, he said, not only Will the Americans make the assault? He continued, we will do so as we did at Stony Point. We will make the assault up with muskets to the point of bayonet. Well, we'll return to Lafayette and beyond Neal in just a moment. Washington solved that dispute by giving the assaults to both the British and the Americans. The main assaulting detachments consisted of 400 troops each. When I say that, just realize that there were many more French and Americans in the direction of the reserve. Some got into the assault, some did not. But the main assaulting detachment were 400 Frenchmen who were ordered to attack Redout No. 9, 400 Americans who were charged with their fault in Redout No. 10. It was shortly after 8 p.m. on the night of the 14th that six artillery shots fired in quick succession. That was the signal to begin the advance. The Americans from the extreme right, the French more toward the center, began moving forward at the same moment. And the Americans were inside and had redoubt number 10 under control in only 10 minutes time. Do you believe that before the firing even concluded that night, the Lafayette actually took a moment to scribble off a note the note read, we beat you. Close. <laughs> Close. The note read, we're in our redoubt. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Yamanil actually wrote back to him and said, we are not yet 
Soon will be. Will be within five minutes. He was fairly close to his word. The French were inside and had redoubt number nine under control in only about 20 to 30 minutes. Now, I always like to ask at this point, I don't think I do, but it's possible. I always like to ask if I have any friends. on all sides because whether you were whether you were German, whether you were French, whether you were British, whether you were an American, going into the assaults that night, going into your defense that night, you did not know if you would be a casualty or not. And all sides did suffer casualties and lost comrades. If you were an Allied soldier who had uh, participated in the main assaults, Not only incorporating redoubts number 9 and 10 into that second parallel, but you also added that earthen wall to the left of redoubt number 9. Okay, now, do you all remember much, much earlier my mentioning that the ground for redoubts number 9 and 10 are could be considered key or critical terrain on this battlefield, giving whichever side it held it a distinct advantage? We've seen the advantage it gave the British. The British holding that territory did indeed delay the Allied approach over that open ground, and in order to secure their second parallel, continue to move with an assaulting distance if they had to, the French and the Americans needed to secure that ground at the cost of life and limb. Once, however, the Allies did secure that ground, consider these factors and the advantage that they were to the French and the Americans. That earthen wall to the left of Redoubt number 9 was used as one of those mass batteries of artillery, a grand American battery of artillery for the purpose of concentrating that mass fire. Now consider redoubt number nine, the artillery battery to the left, and the approximate location of redoubt number 10, and consider them almost as a single position. Now remember that the main British defensive position extends along the water's edge to the northwest in that direction. Now look at the angle that that location holds on the main British defensive position, and remember that front enfilade fire. They control the water. They did fire. that too. They, they did that too. But but Washington also noted in his correspondence a day or so after the Allies took pronounce number nine and ten from that area, the Allies could enfilade the greater part of the main British defensive position. Washington estimated that part of the second parallel was within three hundred yards of the British. Three hundred yards was assaulting distance for infantry of that period. And it was a British officer who brought up the additional point that now the Allies had a crossfire against the main British defensive position. Cornwallis noted the dire situation that he was now in in his next written communication to General Glenn. The next day, Cornwallis situation. 
situation now becomes very We dare not show a gun to their old batteries, and I expect their new one to that our fresh earthen works do not resist their powerful artillery, so that we shall soon be exposed to an assault. is remembered as having been made provision for this he was now willing to forfeit his position on this water but he still had hopes of saving his army if he could get his soldiers onto those vessels and cross and combine them with the garrison until those point Cornwallis hoped he would then have the troops to break through the small French and American soldiers blockading the Tyndall's Point garrison on the landward side, move north, and live to fight another day. Cornwallis chose the concealment of the night on October the 16th of April. Location. Cornwallis surveyed the opposing lines. He took a look at the new Allied position on his left flank, and he made his decision. He went back to his headquarters, and maybe a couple hours later, he sent two British soldiers back to the corner. The young British enlisted soldiers. He stepped atop the curb in that position. He began to beat the British line. That was the official call to Artillery fire remained so heavy all along the Allied lines that morning that the French and American soldiers were yards away. The officer had gone with him to the horn work, very nearly immediately stepped atop the parapet beside him, and that officer began giving the universal signal. changed the enlistment procedures for Continental soldiers, and Continental soldiers in 1777 were then enlisted for three years of the war to take a picture of whichever one was born. So many of our soldiers have been in it for the long haul by this point. Can you imagine how sweet that was? Two days later, formed in marching order behind those fortifications between 2 and 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They began to file out of the position and march down the roadbed at the base of the tree line to my left. Now keep in mind a couple of things about the British who were here that day. Remember that as a result of British victory at the expense of the, of the French in the earlier Seven Years War, the British had virtually established themselves as that era superpower. And certainly not all, but many, if not most, of the British soldiers surrendering here that day were British infantrymen. The British infantry soldier of that period was then considered by many, as well as continues to be considered by many to this day, to have been the finest infantry soldier in all the world at that time. What must it have been like for those hardened, proud soldiers as they marched in surrender and defeat, some would say humiliation, down that roadbed, 
not being allowed to fly their unit standards that they had defended for their very life's blood on numerous, numerous battlefields. They were forced to fall in pieces. What must have been like as they approached just where the second parallel joins the road, or gets the tree line, you can't see just where the second parallel gets the tree line, they met two columns of enemy forces. One column on either side of the road, and there's one account of those both columns of ranks meet. From the British perspective, the British left at the head of that column, General George Washington. And on that side of the road, the American on the British right at the column that uh, at the head of that column was French Lieutenant General Count de Rochambeau and his staff on their horses down that the right side of the road, the French army. So if you were one of those British soldiers, you had to march between those on your left. Us as being no more than the lowly colonists, that, and those on the British right, although they were indeed, the French were considered around the globe to be among the world's finest, and among the world's finest armies. You remember who the French were to the British, don't you? The hated ancestral enemy of several. Is it any wonder to you that the highest ranking British officer present at that ceremony, Brigadier General Charles O. A soldier, he'd been wounded and killed from the courthouse more than once. As he led from Wallace's army through that cordon of troops, he literally between one quarter to some estimate possibly even as much as one quarter of the entire British troop fleet in North America was surrendered here at Yorktown that day. Was that the official end of the war was not. When did the official end come? 1783. Most folks consider it to have been not quite two years later with the final treaty of Paris in early September of 1783. Were there military engagements on North American soil as a part of the revolution after Yorktown? There most certainly were. They were considered or remembered as being minor <coughs> engagements or skirmishes. Good soldiers did get their lives in them though that. And this is not to take away from that, because that truly is uh, But nothing that happened after Yorktown changed or impacted the outcome. Personally, that is why I very firmly believe it is what took place on the ground that we have walked over this afternoon. The ground that if you look around right now continues within our view. What took place here is what took us to Paris in 1783. So the next time you remember that wonderful promise given to us in 1776, 